So the subject of this lecture are, are respiratory physiology disorders. And what we're going to talk about in this lecture is type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure, the differences between them and how they should be treated, a little bit about respiratory acid-base disorders, and then we're going to move on to talk about a specific cause of type 1 respiratory failure, the adult respiratory distress, distress syndrome, ARDS, and also type 2 uh, causes of type 2 respiratory failure, which affect lung ventilation, but actually the lungs themselves are normal. And that's mainly obstructive sleep apnea with some discussion of obesity, hyperventilation, and chest wall and muscle disease. An important point is that ventilatory diseases, which cause chronic respiratory failure, are usually worse at night with worse physiological parameters overnight and first thing in the morning. Right, so type 1 respiratory failure. This is respiratory failure with hypoxia alone, normal PaCO2, but a PaO2 which is less than 8, no matter what the inspired oxygen concentration is. Now this is often an acute one-off event, but it can also be a complication of chronic lung diseases, largely COPD. What's the treatment? Well, it depends on the cause. If somebody comes in with pneumonia and hypoxia as a consequent of type 1 respiratory failure, you clearly treat that pneumonia. Somebody comes, has COPD, you treat the COPD. But the discussion that we're going to have today is really about oxygen and how we use oxygen in patients with type 1 respiratory failure. And essentially, the problem is how to correct the hypoxia and we can use as much oxygen as much as, as, as is necessary in these circumstances. And we give the oxygen normally in a controlled fashion so we know what percentage inhaled oxygen the patient is receiving. So we use Venturi masks to do that, and they have different percentages. And I, some examples are given here, 28%, 35%, 40%. And clearly we use the higher percent oxygen uh, concentrations for patients with more hypoxia. If patients are very hypoxic, we may use a rebreathing bag, uh, which allows an oxygen concentration of about 60% to be inhaled by the patient just using a mask. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to aim for saturations to above 94%, correct the hypoxia completely. But not only that, we'd like to make the patient able to breathe at a comfortable respiratory rate. Because if they're maintaining a saturation of 95%, but they're breathing at 40 per minute, that is not a good situation. That means they're struggling very hard, they will tire, and it's quite likely that they will fail to maintain their oxygenation if they have to keep persisting with a respiratory rate of 40 per minute. So... What do we do if the patient is remaining hypoxic or has a very high respiratory rate despite breathing oxygen from a mask for a rebreathing bag? Well, there is a non-invasive form of ventilatory support called the Continuous Positive Airway Pressure, CPAP. Now, this is a face mask that provides a small amount of additional pressure on the inhaled air, oxygen mix. 5 to 15 centimetres of water, and it maintains that through the whole of respiration, both inspiration and expiration. And what this does is actually recruits more alveolar units that the patient can use during their respiration. It splints open and recruits more alveolar units during inspiration, and that allows the inhaled oxygen concentration to maintain a better arterial oxygen level. And this is a good treatment for isolated type 1 respiratory failure. Somebody presenting with, say, for example, community-acquired pneumonia uh, or pulmonary edema, where they have type 1 respiratory failure but no other uh, major organ damage. If this is not adequate, if this starts to work or the, uh, starts to fail to work or the patient becomes tired despite CPAP therapy, then the next step will be intubation and artificial ventilation in the intensive care department. So what are the common causes of type 1 respiratory failure? Well, acutely, pneumonia, pulmonary aspiration, pulmonary edema, exacerbations of COPD in some patients with COPD, moderately severe asthma, a large pulmonary embolus, and ARDS, which I'll discuss in the later slides. Chronically, patients can have type 1 respiratory failure due to interstitial lung disease, if it's severe enough, if they've had chronic pulmonary emboli leading to significant pulmonary artery damage, then they'll have type 1 respiratory failure, as will patients with severe pulmonary hypertension. And probably the commonest cause is COPD, but that's only some patients. 
And the phenotype that tends to get type 1 respiratory failure are those of the emphysematous pink puffer type phenotype. 